Welcome to the Tax Alpha Solutions Podcast, hosted by Matt Chancy. Matt is a tax consultant, author, and certified financial planner with almost two decades helping his clients grow their net worth. On the show, Matt brings together an array of specialists to share with you their experience and success along with strategies of the 1%. Matt Chancy is with Coastal One, member FINRA SIPC. And now, here's your host, Matt Chancy. Well, good morning, everyone. This is the next episode of the Tax Alpha Podcast, and I'm Matt Chancy. Today, we have a special guest, uh, Camilo Espinoza, and he is an immigration and business attorney, um, business attorney and co-founder of Logica, a boutique firm headquartered in Miami, Florida, with satellite teams in Colombia and Spain. They handle immigration and business cases all over the country and worldwide, specifically around uh, E2, EB-5, L-1, O-1, labor certifications, and H-1B and family green card petitions. So those are things that you're going to definitely have to explain the differences between for the audience today. But Camilo, thanks so much for coming on the show. I appreciate the opportunity. Matt, thank you a lot. It's it's great to be here. Uh, Honestly, interesting, complex, and sometimes... uh, let's say, uh, negative connotation in terms of immigration, but I'm here to help out, clarify, and talk to you. Thank you a lot. Very good. Very good. Well, I appreciate it. Well, hey, let's, you know, let's dig right into kind of to the meat of it a little bit. And there's a lot of crazy codes going on there, and I'm sure they all work in a different way, right? So how would, you know, how does somebody know the difference between those? And how does somebody know what to ask for? Like, it, it almost feels a little overwhelming being an outsider. That's a good way to actually put it. Uh, immigration is a complex uh, area of law. That's what we need to, to get it started, right? And if we look into different categories, for example, family, employment, and investment, those are the, the ways how people can actually immigrate into the United States. So I usually go to a group, Matt, that my first question is a networking group, BNI, and I usually ask, okay, how many of you actually have been born in the U.S.? What about your parents? And what about your grandparents? And honestly, two, 3% actually, they do have grandparents that they actually were born in the United States. Others came maybe as an H1B, maybe they were petitioned by a family member, maybe employment, maybe investment, maybe an asylum, who knows? So there are different ways, different areas of the law, especially in immigration that are very interesting. And that is why you need to talk to a professional, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's super interesting. So let's talk about that. So if somebody said, because I, I don't know the differences between the programs, I'll be honest with you. I know a little bit about EB-5, um, which I believe you might categorize as an investment program, the way that I understand it. So let's start with what I know a little bit about. That'll make it the most fun. So let's talk about EB-5 a little bit and, and why somebody might want to use that program and who's a good fit for that. Okay, so let's start with EB-5. And actually, that's one of the areas of the law that Logica we do the most, investment visas and employment visas. And let me just go a little bit back in the sense that people sometimes uh, think about immigration and and sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes there is a negative connotation uh, in the sense of, oh, this is what's going on in the border in Mexico and the US, right? Or lots of uh, thousands of asylum cases um, and so on. The way how we see immigration is completely different. And and the way how we see this human capital flowing from Europe to the United States, Latin United States. And basically all of us US citizens are also benefiting from it. EB-5 is one of those. So 10,000 visas per year. And these individuals, which are wealthy individuals uh, from every single part of the world, they have the ability to apply to become a US resident. So in other words, sometimes this EB-5 program they are buying a green card. And that's why many people don't like it. Why is that? Because after they have, they have been a green card holder for five years, they can become US citizens. But somehow they are applying and buying a green card if they do have the resources to do so. The way how I like to put it is people who are investing in the United States who are willing to invest $500,000 or $1 million in order to be able to function in our society, to live in our society, invest in our society, create employment in our society. So all of us somehow benefit from that as well. Well, that's, 
Look, I can see if you watch any news whatsoever, there's obviously a stigma uh, it perpetuated in the news about, oh, you know, there's there's always somebody that says we don't want any more people in this country. Right. right. There's, but we all came from somewhere. Right. Like so if you're not a if you're not an indigenous person or wasn't a tribal Indian here, you came from somewhere. Right. That's right. So, I got some Irish and English in me. So there's some, I guess, some old white folks that came over a long time ago and I was kind of hitched on that wagon, I guess. But there's a big difference between somebody, like you said, seeking asylum. I guess that's somebody that shows up at our border and says, hey, I need a safe harbor versus somebody that says I was wealthy in another country and I would like green card and potential citizenship status. And I want to invest in a business, in a growth opportunity in America to achieve that. That's a good that's a good thing. Those are the right people that we definitely want coming to the United States for sure, right? Definitely. And I'm not saying anything against asylees because sure. there are also ways how they can actually come to the States and I respect that. Sure. Uh, but yeah, in terms of investment, I mean, we have hundreds of millions of dollars flowing from different parts of the world. And I'm talking about legal money because we need to do a source of funds and path of funds for every single EB-5 individual. We need to know where this money comes from. And it has to be from a legal source. And these uh, hundreds of millions of dollars are flowing into the United States in different projects. And one of the big, big factors, Matt, in EB-5 is that each EB-5 investor must create 10 jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's huge, right? Especially nowadays. We only have like one big issue nowadays with EB-5 is that uh, the regional center program is suspended or it hasn't been, it hasn't been reinstated. Hopefully by March 11, 2022, we're going to see news as to it. Okay. Gotcha. Makes sense. And yeah, look, I, I hope that didn't come off disparaging against asylum seekers. I get it. Right. But, but I don't think, you know, I don't think the average person, um, if they look at somebody from an immigration process, I don't think that in their mind, the first thing they do is go, well, what immigration path did they take? Right. They're just like, I think people kind of have a binary thought process around a lot of things in life. It's like, oh, they're either a citizen or they're kind of an immigrant. I'm like, well, yeah, maybe. But there's different categories of, across that and different reasons for following each path. Right. And an EB-5 is just a different path to 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 citizenship. That's all it is. Right. Um, it is. And let's put it in, in different ways as well. I mean, how many of us actually have invested half a million dollars or one million dollars in the United States? There's a lot of American investors or whatever, citizens, current citizens, not like hopeful citizens, right, that haven't invested that kind of money to create 10 jobs. Correct. So these are people that under the regulations, they have to do so. If they do not create the 10 jobs, they lose their green card. So they are saying basically to the U.S. government, hey, listen, I, I do have a business plan. I do have an economic plan. I'm creating 10 jobs and they're going to they're going to be given a conditional green card. Two years okay. later, USCIS, which is the agency that reviews all these cases, they're going to go back and see, okay, let me see. Let, show me the I-9s. Show me the W-2s. Show me the 1099s. Well, not 1099s, but the W-2s because they have to be employees and direct employees full time. Sure. Then they go and analyze and they say, you know what? I mean, you met the, the requirements, then you get the, the permanent green card. If not, guess what? They're going to lose the green card. So this is very strict standards requirements and each one has to comply with that so we obviously encourage investors to come to the us i think it's part of, of, of what we actually done in the in the past so i don't see a reason why we have to go against people investing in the united states sure totally understand and so from the people that show up to you and have those conversations around eb5 how many of those people are have their own businesses and ideas of things that they want to start that they want to launch versus there are some EB pro, EB5 programs out there that are investable programs that other people are driving and you become the uh, kind of a limited partner investor type in that type of an opportunity. And this is the stuff that I know about a little bit, right? So how does that break down? That's when it gets complex. That's when EB5 gets, gets complex and uh, each investor must have a lawyer, probably like a securities lawyer as well, and financial advisor, all right? Okay. Because... Uh, there is a lot of fraud in EB-5. So a lot of companies targeting people from China, India, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, and you name it. And these investors come in good faith. They become targets uh, from different scams in EB-5, and then they lose their money. It has happened before. So let's go back to the EB-5 law. So basically the way how it works is the following. 
as of today, you invest $1 million and you create 10 jobs. That's basically the law, all right? Unless, and this is the exception of the law, you invest half a million dollars, but then you have to invest in a rural area or an area in which the unemployment uh, is, is basically more than 150% average. Right. Taking into account the whole the, uh, United States. So those are called targeted employment areas, which are not that hard to find, but that's a way to actually encourage investors to invest in different areas that otherwise they wouldn't have invested. And it's good for the economy as well, because those underdeveloped areas are actually being developed. And there was another, um, another law, which was for regional centers. So regional centers, let's say here in Miami. So they, they built the Paramount uh, condo, which is in downtown Miami, huge hundreds of millions of dollars to actually build this condo. So these uh, huge developers, they go and say, you know what, let's do EB-5 and let's say that 20, 30% of the project is gonna be funded by EB-5. So they created this regional center program in which regional center business completely independent of the investors or even the developers, they're actually regulated by USCIS and they are allowed to participate in projects to basically say, hey, listen, I, I think this project is good. I'm gonna support, I'm gonna actually give you the validation that, that you need for the project. So you can start getting funded by EB-5. So let's say that investors can just go and invest half a million dollars. The, the whole regional center program can actually accept indirect employment as well. So that's good, especially in construction because it's not only about the W-2, but it can be 1099s as well. So for example, the person who's delivering the, the windows, the person who's actually uh, the, the cement and so on. So basically, or even inducive employment in which other areas of the law, because of this building, they actually build a McDonald's. You can actually right. cover those jobs as well. So in a, either way, the regional center program opened the doors for like hundreds of investors as well. The only issue that we have is that it's supposed to be reinstated in March 11. So we're actually looking and waiting for Congress to see what they actually decide. Most likely the amount is going to be raised to 750. That's what we are actually hearing. From Congress. Gotcha. So the amount to then invest through a regional center would be 750. That's what it looks like. It gotcha. looks 700,000 to 750. Okay, gotcha. So makes sense. So, you know, a lesser amount of money can be invested, but it has to be in an area that needs economic growth and stimulus, or a larger amount of money can be invested in, in a more trophy type asset or business opportunity, right? Or if you go to a regional center, about 750. So there's a few different ways to access the program. Makes sense. Right. Let's talk about the fraud piece. I think that would be really interesting to anybody because nobody wants to get scammed. Nobody wants to be frauded. So knowing what you know from the inside looking out, how would someone avoid a fraud or a scam? How would someone make sure that what they're looking at from an investment opportunity is legitimate and they're not just being targeted? It is hard. It is hard even for lawyers or other professionals like yourself, Matt. So I think the first thing that investors must do is hire a law firm that is specialized in EB-5 and actually have a financial advisor and be aware of, of certain things. For example, the lawyer referring a project. You know what? That can actually be suspicious as well. We as, as lawyers can just go and refer a project. We can go and say, hey, listen, I do have clients who have invested in X amount of projects, you want to go and, and meet and sit down with them, that's fine. But we can't just go and participate in the whole thing because that's when it becomes like very suspicious. And I've seen lawyers getting in trouble with the SEC and also, yeah, and with USCIS as well. So that's one thing. Second, be careful with all this uh, information online, right? Like lots of information online. I don't know if you, have you seen the, the Tinder thing in Netflix in which this guy- Oh, yeah, that's crazy, right? With EB-5, it happens all the time. And the issue is that we're talking about like hundreds of millions of dollars. Like a lot of fraud and a lot of people convicted and a lot of people charged. So they need to, what I usually tell the client is, listen, EB-5, even though it's calling an investment visa, it's not really an investment visa because you don't go for the return on investment. Why not? Because look at the whole thing, uh, Matt. I'm putting half a million dollars and I'm getting in return 0.5%, 1%, 1.5 per year. That's my whole return investment. Okay. That's very low, right? That's right. It's low. not a not a great return on my money. There's better places I could put it for that. Correct. And you actually know about this a lot. 
So why people do it? Well, listen, the projects that they actually offer five, 10, 15 percent on return, that's kind of, that's very suspicious. Why don't they go to the bank then? Why do they have to go to investors? And that's when I usually tell the clients these like the big projects and the more stable projects, the return investment and the interest is really, really low. And it has to be low. Otherwise, the developer just go to a bank. It's a cost of capital issue. If they can get cheaper money somewhere else, they're going to get cheaper money. If your money is cheap, well, that's great, but it comes with additional benefits that are maybe more valuable than a higher interest rate to you. The green card. The green card. The green card. So whenever you see a project, hey, 10% interest, listen, run away. Run away because I'm not saying that it's a fraud. Sure. But Sometimes when things look a little disproportionate, uh, that's when you need to question yourself and say, okay, why? Sure. No, that's great feedback. So be careful if your lawyer's pitching you a deal. Be careful of the stuff that you see that's online and be careful of something that's offering a crazy high rate of return. I've seen 50% return on investment. Imagine that. 50%. 50%. And I've seen things that are uh, crazy weird. If I, if I were an investor as a client, and I will just go and invest in projects that are involved in real estate. Those are the most stable projects. Sure, real estate. They, build, they are building something. Right. If they go and say, you know what, like you have to invest in this company that is investing in cannabis or investing in crypto or investing in X, Y, Z, in oil and gas. I'm not saying that it's fraud. No, but those are like risky, risky projects. Right. I Most of the stuff that I've seen in my experience that fits this narrative is typically hospitality, hotels and stuff that are built and or um, industrial distribution type facilities. So Amazon type distribution facilities where there's going to be a ton of humans in there moving packages around and delivery and all the other stuff associated with it. So for the job creation element, those are the typical stuff that I've seen on my side. I've seen like a, like a bunch, like you can imagine every single, there was a time in, in Hawaii in which they were building these uh, water plants. And I'm like, okay, that's, I wouldn't do it. I would never do it as a client. Disclaimer, no offense to EB5 developers. Uh, you do whatever you want to do. But I mean, as a potential investor, if I were the, the foreign national, that would be a little, probably I wouldn't invest in those type of projects. No, it makes a ton of sense. Absolutely. So, okay. So I think that's a good fundamental understanding of EB-5, you know, what it does, the different programs, how to watch out for fraud. I think that's, and you know, and, and the type of person that that would attract. So let's pivot a little bit and talk about a different, uh, I guess you would call it a code, an E-2. Let's talk about an E-2. How does that compare and contrast with an EB-5? Well, the, the E2 is an investor visa. It's a non-immigrant visa. So in other words, you don't go to the green card directly because of the E2. It doesn't mean that you cannot go to a green card through another uh, category through the immigration system. So we can do so. The E2 has uh, three main requirements, Matt. The first one, there must be a treaty nation between the two countries. Let's say the United States or wherever this person is from. So we know that, for example, in LATAM, they are not treated between the U.S. and Venezuela, U.S. and, and Brazil. U.S. and Uruguay, U.S. and Bolivia, U.S. and Peru, Ecuador's uh, treaty just actually uh, was eliminated uh, a few years ago. So there must be a treaty of commerce. The good thing is that, for example, the whole European Union, have, they do have treaties with, uh, with the United States. So what we do is that we do a lot of investor visas with people from Argentina, Mexico, Colombia, Spain, Italy, Germany, and so on, Canada as well. One of the countries that actually has more E2 visas is Japan, Japan and Canada. Very strange, Japan. But you know what? We do have good relationships uh, with people from Japan. And, and people from Japan want to be in the United States. Believe it or not, people actually love the United States. So that's, that's great. Second main requirement, uh, the investor must invest a substantial amount of money. So a lot of people come to us, Camilo, so what is a substantial amount? Is $100,000 enough? $200,000 enough? $10 million, it depends. And why it depends? Because each business is different. So it has to be proportionate to the business. How much does it need to, to open a, a real estate company in Miami? Maybe I need half a million dollars, maybe $300,000, $400,000. How much do I need to open a restaurant, an Italian restaurant in New York? Maybe 150 is enough. So each business is different, so it depends. What I cannot do is just go and buy a business for myself so I can self-employ myself and then probably invest like $20,000.
No, okay. that's hard. Most likely it's not gonna, the consul overseas are not gonna like it and uh, USCIS officers are not gonna like it. So we've seen it, the median is approximately $150,000 for an visa, 150 mm -hmm. to 300. And the three main requirement, Matt, is basically that it must be a bona fide enterprise. And what do I mean by that? It means that it must be an active uh, business. It's gonna require licenses. It's gonna be. It's gonna invoice enterprises. It's gonna receive money. It's gonna have a lease agreement signed. It's gonna have a website. It's gonna employ one or two people. So it's a real business. It can't be just hey, I'm buying. I don't know if you know that here in Miami they are building this Aston Martin building, and the, one of the penthouses is fifty million dollars. I go and invest $50 million? No, because it's a passive investment. So even if you rent it out for, I don't know, what, like 50K? Uh, doesn't matter because you can be in Argentina, you can be in Spain, and you can just be receiving the rent. And that's it. No, we need actually an active business. So as long as we have those three, treaty, substantial amount, an active business, we can go and say okay to a client so we can continue exploring the E2 route to come to the United States. Okay, is E2 easier or not as easy as EB5? How would you determine which path you would pick? The EB5, you do have the, the money and the money is legal. Basically it, it was obtained through a, through a legal source. Then I wouldn't say easier, but it's simpler. What we usually specialize in logic and, and other immigration law firms is looking at the path of funds and the source of funds. Right. Obviously, Where do we come from? Right. And obviously the, the investor must look into the financials of the project because they have two main questions. Does the project qualify? And two, is my money secure? Even though it's a risk, it must, I mean, they, they have to feel confident that they're not going to go and lose it, right? Even though one of the requirements is that it must be a risk. In E2, you have to get involved into the business. You have to basically find the lease, Having a website. You've got to materially participate. It's not just an investment. You've got to participate physically. And actively, if you really want your business to succeed. So you are just creating the whole thing. For EB5, you can do so as well through the direct investment. Sure. But I believe that sometimes in E2, it requires more energy. Okay. Understood. I think that's a really clear definition between the two. The EB-5 could be more of an investment, but you need to be an active participant in this other business if you're going to go down an E-2 path. Correct. And I believe the smaller the, the investment and the more the smaller the business, for example, like a restaurant, actually sometimes you have to be really, really invested in those type of businesses because that's what, let's go and talk to a full requirement. You must come to the United States to direct the business. So you are directing the business. Absolutely. No, 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 that makes a ton of sense. I totally get that. Okay, fair. All right. So covered a couple of those. So then let's uh, let's shift and let's talk about the L1 a little bit. What's an L1? Well, L1 is one of those craziest uh, petitions. Everyone wants to do an L1. So they call me, a guy from Chile, uh, called me about, let's say, one hour and a half ago. And like, hey, listen, I want to do an L1 because this realtor, blah, 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 told me that I qualify. I'm like, okay, let's see, let's explore, let's see what you have to say. And I usually, and I love listening to clients. At the end, I start like explaining the law and explaining what they need to do. So guy from Chile, they do have a company in Chile, but the company doesn't have any employees. Uh, the guy is not in payroll, plenty of money, wants to invest in the United States. So he's like, can I do an L1? So I'm like, yes and no. Sometimes, the, most of the time, the L was created for multinational companies. So let's say Apple wants to transfer personal. IBM wants to transfer personal from Europe to the United States. Um, Microsoft, uh, Oracle, and so on. Honestly, it's for these type of companies. Okay, but big companies. Main companies. That's a blanket L1. However, other small, middle-sized companies, obviously, they can apply as well. But the idea of the L1 is that you are transferring an executive or manager from the company overseas into the United States. Okay. You want to affiliate that it can be a new company or it can be a company that is already established. But pay attention, man. You're, you're transferring an executive or manager. It can be any employee. Okay. And immigration is very particular in the definition of manager or executive. So what happens with many small, small businesses everywhere in the world? 
you are the business owner, CEO, president, but at the same time, you have to do day-to-day -day activities of the company because that's, the that's, right. that's, that's real business. USCA doesn't like that. So they want to see an executive is basically directing the company, directing the business, the vision. They don't want to see an executive basically doing secretarial or managerial roles. Not really. Right. And the managerial, as to the manager, they don't want to see the manager doing the day-to-day -day, and they want to see the manager managing people. And people, it can't be just like a secretary. No, it has to be professionals under the immigration code. So in that case, when you transfer someone, these people must be someone that was that is at the, at the top. And also people who, these, usually the overseas company, they do have like 10, 15 people, 20 people. And the company in the US, that's the issue. That sometimes we have these investors that they just want to transfer an employee. But they're like, Camilo, this is a new company. I can't just go and hire 10 people right now. It's too expensive, even if I can do so. And they are right, but they have to. They if have they're going to try to, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. It, they have to have enough employees for somebody to be a manager or of. You have to have enough other people doing the work if you're really in that executive management type role. Or will you transfer a CEO of a company to a company over in the United States that has like one person or two people? Most likely this person is, going, is not going to be doing uh, CEO duties. He's going to most likely do anything that comes to do for the company, right? I mean, that's it's, right. It's, 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 so that's the main issue of the else. But the good thing about the else is that it's a dual intent visa. So what is that supposed to mean? That even though it's a non-immigrant visa, basically saying, hey, I'm not applying for the L to become a green card holder. The person doesn't have to have a foreign residency. So basically they can go and apply to become a green card holder through an EB1C category. So that's great. So that basically means that uh, someone that applies for an L1 they say L1A can actually apply to an EB1C and become a green card holder. On the other hand, an E visa, an E2 visa, you can't do so directly through the E. Okay. And, and an E2 is a non immigrant and it doesn't have dual intent as the L. So the L can be good, it can be good for different investors and also, but just pay attention to this executive uh, and manager uh, requirement that is, that we've seen it a lot in requests for evidence in USCIS. Interesting. Interesting. So what I'm learning is there's a lot of different ways to, well, well, there's an old expression. There's a lot, there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? And it sounds like that's applicable here. There's a lot of different ways to potentially, you know, gain access or gain citizenship, but we've got to figure out what your life looks like, where you're at, what you want your life to look like here, and then figure out the path that you navigate to get from A to B, right? That's right. Makes a lot of sense. Interesting. Okay. I love that. Thanks for sharing. So the next one I've got written down here is kind of an O1. Talk about an O1 a little bit. What, what makes that different? Well, the O1s, we do a lot of O1s in, in the office. And why? About two years, two, three years ago, we actually got in, in the entertainment industry for legal cases in the sense that we actually met a few actors and actresses from LATAM, Matt. And one of uh, our good friends, Carmen Villalobos, she's got like 90 million uh, followers on Instagram. So okay. sometimes once in a while, she actually promotes uh, myself, my Instagram page or, or Logica, and it's been great. But there is a, a misunderstanding as well. Many people go and say, oh, I want to apply for the talent visa. So I'm like, okay, that sounds maybe for promotional marketing, selling, we can call it talent, right? It's not... Okay. A lot of us maybe were talented. Who knows, right? So, but that doesn't mean that that they that we do qualify for an O one. So, is the O one is for extraordinary abilities in the field, science, arts, education, athletics, and business. That's it, and it has to be related into those. That there are actually some factors to prove that whether you actually qualify or not. So, we usually the way what. What I explain to a client is like, please, I want to imagine that you're going, that you want to cast for, I don't know, let's say for Universal in, in LA, and then you really want this role. I want to know every single thing about you. I mean, everything that you've done since you were like a little kid. So update your resume, send it to me, and I want to see whether you actually qualify or not. So the old ones are for people who are in the top of their field. And when I mean top of their field, I mean, someone who has uh, awards nationally or internationally, someone who has uh, published articles, books, uh, studies, uh, anything that, that you can name at, someone who has actually done a lot of interviews, 
radio, let's say internet, let's say print media. What, what about like a Premier League soccer player or something? Football. We've we done it as well. We've done it and we actually work a lot with athletes in the tennis field and in soccer as well. We actually okay. did, let's say that the sister of the O1 for, for, a green, for green card purposes is the EB1A. And we actually did um, an EB1A for a soccer player. I can't name the person, but so I was a little hesitant of this visa because he wasn't like a Messi or Ronaldo. He's basically someone that played in the third league of Spain. He was good. He played college in a great university in the United States and he was actually sponsored. But you know what? The guy was good maybe not great, but we did a really, really good petition. And he qualified because even though he didn't have any international awards, he had the other factors. And he came to the United States to continue pursuing his career here in the States. So it's for, we can say for very talented people, but who are at the top and who can show it. So you have to show it. Well, hey man, that's a, I was going to say that bar that you put up there for a soccer player is pretty high to say, if you're not a Messi or a Ronaldo, <laughs> there's only two of those. <laughs> that's true. Those are like the, the exception because that, those are like, you know what, there is actually a, another test for the old ones or EB1 says in which if you have a, an international award, immediately you qualify. Forget about it. USCIS is like, you know what, got it. Thank you. And we need these people here. Right, we need representing them the US rather than, than going and representing another country. And it has happened to us. Like we I did a live in Instagram with this guy, I can't say the name because he allowed me to do, to say it. Juan Camilo Perez. He is in the in the he skates, but he's a world champion. Okay. Uh, nine gold medals on behalf of Colombia. That was the easiest petition ever. That's an award. Nine gold medals is an award. Yeah. And then the USCIS approved the case in three months. No premium processing, love it. And Juan Camilo is super happy. Now he's just very, waiting for the record. Very nice. That's that's super cool. That that's very interesting. Never heard of that. Never heard of that at all. So that's and those really are the people who we need here as well. If you want to get when immigration gets uh it, it's very political, especially nowadays. But you know what? It's been always political. Always. Yes. Like it is crazy. Those are the people who we need here. Highly talented people who have achieved like a lot, who can actually help us here in the States to become better. I mean, I've seen it like in, in every single field, in, in athletics, in business, in science, education, arts, TV production with O1Bs. I believe that's a very interesting category, the O's. Yeah, absolutely. Those are the people that we wanna be here, that we wanna learn from, that we wanna interact with, that makes it a better place. I think that the positive side of immigration, Matt, when we talk about investment and employment, and maybe what I meant to say at the beginning of the interview, may not I don't want to say the negative side, but the, the sad part sometimes of immigration is everything else that is happening, right? That is a fact as well. All people who are in the border want to come here. They may qualify or not. Children who are separated, but that's like the, that's very sad what is happening, but it's, it's a fact as well. On the other side, we have all these O's, E's, EB-5s, else in which, hey, I wanna, I'm knocking on the door because we do have the resources or because of my own uh, resume, I can actually qualify for an immigration benefit. And that's, that's good as well. Sure. Understood. Understood. So um, I know a little, so the next I want to have on the list is the H-1B. And I know a little, I've seen some TV programs on this about where isn't this one where, and I don't want to butcher it too bad, where maybe uh, tech companies have historically brought over people from other countries that were very skilled in the tech space to, to help them build an IP, a technology or an app or something like that. And then that's kind of what I think I know about it. So yes. And we also have like two, two main CEOs who actually came to the U.S. Uh, because of an H-1B. So ha have you heard about Elon, someone that is named Elon Musk? Heard of that guy before, heard of that guy. <laughs> H-1B, H-1B, Matt. And how many now, how many employees uh, Tesla and all and the other two companies have? Like, I don't know. Wait a minute, Elon Musk is a citizen through H-1B? He came out to the U.S. through an H-1B based on what, what I read in his uh, biography as well. And uh, he also came up with a student visa. So Elon is, is not originally from the United States. He wasn't born in the United States. He 
I believe he was born in, in South Africa, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. That's fun. I did not know that. That is super interesting. That's, that's fun. The founder of Instagram as well. They found before before it was bought by, by Facebook, H1B as well. And a lot of people, a lot of people from H1B. Why H1B? H1B is controversial though. H1B is for a specialty occupation uh, position, like the specialty occupation visa. That's what it is. So sure. what does that mean? Can everyone qualify for H1B? No, not really. So even if you have a job offer, it doesn't mean that you qualify. The occupation must be a special under the regulations and not only special uh, qualifications, it must be related to what you're going to do. So let's say a lawyer, I want to hire a, I don't know, like a legal secretary. That's, she doesn't qualify. Sure. She's not a specialty occupation. A lawyer, yes, it does. But I can't just go and hire anyone. So in the tech industry, we have now the other side, right? A lot of tech company hiring thousands of people from China and India. It's a fact. It happens. We're in H1B season now, man. But also, because we do a lot of H-1B, we've done more than three, 4,000 uh, petitions in H-1B. Most of these people, the minimum education requirements is a master's degree. Everyone has a bachelor's, master's, U.S. doctorate. Sure. It's crazy. Sure. Like, they're highly educated people. I've heard that some of the, and I think I've got this right, I've heard that some of the, the pushback on that type of visa is that if they could hire somebody from India or China that has that level of qualification, that there's maybe a pay disparity gap between what they might pay that person that would come from India, what they would have to pay somebody that was already a citizen here, potentially in the United States. Is there any truth to that? No, really. I know the argument, but I'll explain it to you maybe the, the, the other side, uh, because there's always a counter argument, right, for everything sure not only immigration, for everything in life. So U.S. employers, employers, I'm sorry, they, they need to pay the prevailing wage, the minimum. And th those are guidelines by the Department of Labor. Okay. okay. So you can't just go and say, hey, I'm hiring, a, um, let's say, a, a software engineer from New Delhi. And obviously, I pay this person, let's say, $1,000 in rupees, in, in, and I, I'm going to pay $2,000 in the U.S. No. You have to pay the minimum of the prevailing wage. So in other words... You are protecting U.S. work as well. So you just don't go and underpay these people, right? right. Yes. So there is a minimum. On the other side, I see as well, if you have like a lot of H-1B people and then you just pay the, the minimum prevailing wage and they are willing to work for the minimum prevailing wage, then it's going to be harder, right? It's going to be harder to go and increase the salaries for other people who are here. I, sure. I see that as well. But these people actually make a lot of money. So in, in, the, in, in technology... I was talking with someone the other day, I can't say names or names of the company, huge company, one of the biggest companies in, in the world. And we do have people that are making $300,000, $400,000, like in technology. Easy. Those are good incomes. Yeah. And I'm not talking about people from San Francisco, Texas. This sure. Not as expensive as San Francisco, but you know what? In, in technology, they make a lot of money. I, I, we usually, H1Bs, the, the minimum that they make is 100 k Minimum. Sure. But we've seen a lot here, especially the other day, my business partner, Harry Typers, he was talking with a staffing agency from Illinois. He was like, do you guys have people to work? Do you know someone who wants to work? If you know anyone, it can be technology, science, let me know because we need these people. And that's the reason why we have all these programs. Sure, sure. Well, I mean... One of the biggest issues that I think has been exposed recently by the pandemic is the, the lack of quality human capital out there of people that want jobs that, you know, there's feels like there's a lot of opportunity right now for people that are willing to work and get retrained and, and but not everybody is willing to lean into that opportunity. So, you know, I don't, I don't care if the talent you know, comes from here domestically already or something that we have to import. As long as we've got the best person for the job, I think that's what's most important, right? Yeah, it's a fact. Also, uh, we need to take into account that other countries are doing the same. Canada is doing the same. They're doing the same. And also, what about if all these people go to another country? They go to Russia. They, they go to China. For this sure. So we're attracting the best people as well. And I think that's the way how we grow as well. But that's like a I don't want to get uh, into politics. Sure. But it's something that, that is very interesting. And we need the people here. Sure. 
good people are what make or what power the whole thing and what make it grow. Good. That's super interesting. Super interesting. And, you know, for the sake of time, we're running, I got, there's another thing. So labor certifications, I doesn't have a code, but it's also something that was listed as a, you want to talk a little bit about what a labor certification is? Yes. We call the labor certification, uh, the PERM, P-E-R-M. And the labor certification, basically, uh, let's say that you are in H-1B. And now you are like, okay, you know what? I do have status for six years. H-1B is not permanent, six years only. Then right. what? what do I do? I want to stay in the States and the company actually wants to sponsor me to get a green card. So you start a whole process with the Department of Labor. What is the idea of the PERM? There are no US uh, qualified workers that are willing to do the job. So the, every uh, company that they do a labor certification for an employee, they have to go through a recruitment period. So they have to actually try their best to hire US workers first. So they have to do a recruitment. It's very specialized. It's very picky DOL. Even if you miss one letter, one deadline, anything, they will deny the petition. It's, it's that strict. But it's one way for foreign nationals to become green card holders. Okay, so the perm is the EB2 and EB3 categories under the employment area. So we do a lot of perms. Uh, most of these perms are very highly complicated. So let's say, uh, Matt, that you want to do a green card petition through family by yourself. That's fine. They say that you are very smart and you want to do an e-visa for yourself. I'm okay with that. A perm, you need a lawyer. And you need a US lawyer and you need an immigration lawyer because it's highly sophisticated, complex, but it's a great way how we can actually, uh, how foreign nationals can become uh, green card holders and then US citizens. But they have to go through a process that takes about three years. So many people go and say, oh, we just have these, these people who come to the States and immediately they are getting green cards. No, really. I mean, yes and no. It takes time. It takes three years. It takes a US employer who needs these people. And the US employer must do a recruitment um, process in which basically they go and attest that they couldn't find US workers. So it's a system, basically, especially where we live in now. We don't have enough people that want to work. Well, that's one way that we, um, we've done it through the past. It's not only now, it's decades before we, we've done the same thing. So that's a good sure. opportunity for, for employers to bring talented individuals as well into the U.S. That's what I'm taking away from this for me personally, is that there's a lot of different paths to get here, but all of them take time. Like there's no instant... I mean, even the one that might seem instant, let's assume that I was a, a professional athlete somewhere else or I, a scholar and I wrote a book. Well, yes, I might get that citizenship program or that green card relatively quickly here, but I put a bunch of time and effort into being really good at what I did somewhere else so that once I got to that point, they're like, yeah, OK, you're the type of person we want here. That the quality of what I worked that I had done before I showed up is what helped me speed up the process once I was on this side of the equation. Agree. Okay. You, you put it uh, better than myself. That's interesting. That's I ne never really thought about it contextually that way, you know, and I think it's, you know, I think life in general is a lot like that. You know, for example, you know, uh, I played college football and this is just a dumb example. But, you know, if a guy was really good in high school football and then he was really good in college football. Well, guess what? The NFL gives him a chance earlier than everybody else because they're like, there's a high likelihood this guy's going to be good at the next level, too. Whereas if you were kind of OK in high school and maybe on the team right. in college, like you're probably not going to get drafted and you're not going to get much playing time. But if you show up at camp and you work way harder than everybody else and get paid way less, you might end up making the team. But that's because your resume wasn't as strong when you got there. So they're not going to give you the more preferential treatment. Right. That is correct. And, and let's not forget about something as well, in case people go and say, oh, but what do you mean? So then we have high talented people. They don't uh, atrocities in their own home country or here in the States arrested and then they come and get a green card no everything that we said in the last 45 minutes is we assume that these people basically their profile perfect plain no arrest no criminal record no overstay right. they came with a visa absolutely nothing so it's very hard to come as well 
And that's tough because people make mistakes. Good people make mistakes every once in a while, you know, like it's so let me ask if you got caught drinking and driving a DUI or something in another country and you otherwise had a perfect profile, that would that would be a problem. It will be a problem because when you file the forms and one of them is in, in the consulate, the DS-160, and if you go and say, have you been arrested, including another country, that can create more questions. And if you've been arrested uh, for DUI in the U.S. twice, you can actually be, you're going to be penalized. You're most likely, you're going to have issues getting immigration benefits. Wow. So 100%. Like, uh, I'm talking here like people who basically are clean, as you can imagine, uh, yeah, clean, nothing. Yeah. Everything yeah. is clear. So uh, if you have an issue, then obviously there are things are going to get complicated. Can be sure. done with waivers for non-immigrant immigrant cases, but that's a completely different conversation. But it just makes it harder. It just makes everything harder. Correct. And people say, hey, you, people from Mexico just go on and cross the, the border and they get a green card. No, no, really. Like they can't do so. If you enter the U.S. without a visa, you can't get any immigration benefit. Maybe one or two, which is VAWA, different category in which is violence against uh, women and children. Sure. Anything else, even if you get married with a, with a U.S. citizen, you have to go back to your home country. You can't just go and, and get a green card in the United States. So it's hard. It's very, very hard to get those benefits. Sure. And taking all of that, the totality of what you've explained, would make sense why there are some people that want to be in the United States, but know that they may not be able to take the, the direct path to doing it necessarily the right way. And they try to get here in other ways because they're like, man, I, I got to get out of where I'm at. I would love to be there, but I'm never going to be able to meet the guidelines of all these stringent processes, right? Yeah. Most of the people don't meet the guidelines. Most of the people. And that puts people in a tough spot. They have to be in their home countries. Yeah. Understood. Understood. Well, Camilo, this is really interesting. And I learned a lot today. I hope I hope everybody else listening learned a lot, too. You know, this is stuff that, you know, you might could read on the Internet, but it's not nearly as fun and engaging as having you explain it to me. <laughs> Matt, thank you a lot. And, and I'm so sorry in case I missed something or maybe I put my disclaimer always, you know, this is not a legal representation for anyone. So <laughs> if you want to get more information, we can actually do a one to one and no more information about your case, uh, family case, or, or whatever. But it's, uh, it's very informational. This is for very informational, right? Absolutely. That's the point. Look, the point is just to help people understand things that maybe they didn't know and point them in the right direction so they start asking better questions, right? So tell the people today how they might, for the listeners, you know, how would they find you? If somebody were going to reach out and contact you, how do you want them to find you? Okay, two ways. Super easy. My cell phone, 305 726 one five three seven three zero five seven two six one five three seven. You can call me and send me a text or WhatsApp, or you can go to my Instagram attorney dot Camilo and Camilo C A M I L O, and you send me a message. Uh, we do have a team. We do have a marketing team and a sales team, and we respond every single text. It goes through WhatsApp or Instagram. Ad. Very nice. Very modern communication approach. <laughs> but I do it. Uh, I do get a lot of clients from Instagram. It's crazy. I didn't know that. But you know what? It's great. Yeah. It's you just you never know where the next client's going to come from sometimes. And if you have to embrace those different communication uh, technology platforms to because people reach out in all different ways. So good for you. Good stuff. I've seen other lawyers uh, getting clients through TikTok. TikTok. <laughs> And I'm not talking about like small cases, like big cases. It's crazy. Well, they must they must have way better dance moves than I have. <laughs> probably, probably. <laughs> Good stuff, my friend. Well, Camilo, I appreciate you being on the day and sharing your expertise with us uh, for entertainment purposes only. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but everybody, thanks for listening in today. Uh, thanks for being a guest, or, or you know, for paying attention. And this was Matt Chancy. This was another episode of the Tax Alpha Podcast. And until next time, be well. Thank you, Matt. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Tax Alpha Solutions brought to you by Matt Chancy. We hope you enjoyed listening to this week's guests and insight. If you liked what you heard, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts.